Clifton College has in its possession two fragments of papyrus from Egypt, um, from a place called Oxyrhynchus, the so-called city of sharp-nosed fish. And they were given to Clifton College in 1901 by a man called Bernard Grenfell. And Bernard Grenfell and his partner Hunt, they went out to Oxyrhynchus shortly after their undergraduate degrees. And they were fortunate enough to excavate a rubbish tip outside of this town. And the reason why Grenfell gave them to Clifton College is that he was a pupil here at the school. Rather amusingly, during his time at Clifton College, his classical skills were called into question and he was not considered to be very good at composition or construing and was actually advised to give up on the classics. It's a good thing that he ignored the advice because he went on to study classics at Queen's College, Oxford and appointed Professor of Papyrology. At Oxyrhynchus, the conditions were just right to enable the papyrus to survive. The, the very dry conditions meant that the papyrus fragments would not rot. And so although they are damaged and often broken, they could be retrieved from these rubbish dumps outside of the city. I suppose that the fact that we have any papyrus remains from Oxyrhynchus at all is uh, extraordinary. Papyrus was expendable, disposable, just like paper. It wasn't built to last and yet we have a, a hoard of some 500,000 papyrus fragments. We know that Oxyrhynchus was uh, a regional capital. It was the capital of the gnome of Uab, and so therefore has a key bureaucratic role. And to that end, we find receipts, tax returns, certificates, military documents. We've got fragments by Sappho and Archilochus, which have been uh, unearthed, rediscovered for the first time. Um, and we've also got a very large volume of official and semi-official and completely private uh, correspondence. And the two fragments here at Clifton College are numbered amongst that latter category. Both of them written in Greek, um, both of them relatively small. Um, we'll start with a smaller one, which consists of four lines of uh, Greek text and actually deals with a formal invitation to a dinner in celebration of uh, a marriage um, it's clearly correspondence between uh, two private individuals. Um, the, the writer is called Herais, but the recipient uh, is not actually named in the fragment that we possess. And Herais is asking her friend um, to come to dinner on the following day at a particular hour, at nine o'clock in the evening, um, to celebrate the marriage of her children. Normally when we study ancient Greek texts, we're going through them with with a fine tooth comb. We're looking very, very carefully at the text, carefully crafted by those authors, trying to find points of stylistic interest. And one of the things which is best about papyri like this is the fact that none of that is present. These aren't consciously carefully crafted. What I find particularly interesting um, about this text is that the guest is not being invited uh, to dinner long in advance. Um, it is literally the day before the event. The wedding referred to is actually of more than one child. Um, it's technon in the Greek, so it's um, the wedding of her children. So the larger of the two fragments is again a letter, this time from someone named as Irene, um, to two others, Taunophris and uh, Philo and um, she has sent a sum of money which is to be used to pay a craftsman who's also named as Paramon. And alongside this transfer of a sum of money, um, she has given as a gift um, a quantity of fruit. Um, we've got a record of dates and of grapes and of 25 pomegranates. Um, so it's an interesting accompaniment to a financial transfer. And uh, this is quite striking because in a warm country like Egypt in North Africa, um, you might expect the growing of pomegranates and dates, but the bunches of grapes are a little bit of a surprise. It provides evidence for us uh, for the local production around Oxyrhynchus uh, of grapes and presumably also the production of wine, which would then have been traded throughout the length and breadth of the Roman Empire. In return, Irene requests that when her portmanteau, her baggage is sent back to her, included in it is a, a quantity of laxative. It's quite amusing that she writes, literally, since uh, necessarily is there a need for me of it. The combination of anankaios and kraya uh, really emphasizes the fact that she has a desperate need for this laxative. 
Now the papyrus fragments are of course um, not much to look at in and of themselves, but they are of incredible uh, historical importance. If you go to a museum, you might expect to see uh, statues or uh, jewellery made of precious metals. And you wouldn't look twice um, at a couple of scraps of papyrus. And yet the historical value is just as great as for these flashier items. One of the things that makes papyrus such an exceptional historical source is the fact that it was never designed to be preserved. People weren't consciously recording history in the way you would be if you were carving something on stone. And so the information we have, preserved by chance uh, via these big rubbish pits outside Oxyrhynchus, is like gold dust. It tells us about the things which are mundane and day-to-day. -day. The sort of information which is uh, perhaps too embarrassing or seems too trivial to formally record. And therefore, for anthropologists, this is one of the most useful sources of all. It tells us what genuine life was like without the, the sugar coating or the fine polishing. And so from that point of view, the papari found at Oxyrhynchus really are um, gems from a dump.